blitz into marriage and really go into uncharted territories. Yeeks. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Father God, I ask you to continue to help us on the journey as we continue. Pray we finish up this subject and then uh, move on to the mystery of marriage. Uh, bless this time, we ask it for your blessing in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right, we're on requirements for change. Um, oh, boy. How do you change? Well, I'm going to go through some fundamental things and not spend a whole lot of time expanding on it because I spent so much time on addiction and and uh, depression kind of stuff. But, but in requirements for change, uh, I would suggest there needs to be uh, not on uh, A. Oh, let me check how your handout looks again so I'm on the same page. Uh, that's the next one. Uh, uh-oh, I'm confused. We'll get it back. Here we go. Requirements for change. Before we get to letter A, it'll be a little bit redundant for the outline. Well, requirements for change, number one is to be obedient to God's way. Uh, under requirements to change, Roman rule number three, I would like a, not A, but uh, a love for God and love for man. Love for God, love for man, the greatest commandment and the second commandment. And then... Uh, if we're going to grow, if we're going to do that things, we're going to be planting seeds in the soil. We're going to uh, 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 remind ourselves of the parable of the soils. Um, the seed's the same. It's what kind of ground does it go into. And I don't know why, whether there's stony soil or fertile soil or, you know, where the birds come or the cares of this world. I, I, I don't understand all the different soils, but I know I meet people in all different places on the journey of what kind of soil it is. So... Uh, as we start going through this, we have to realize if change is going to take place, people are going to change at a different rate of speed, unique to the, with their own place on the journey. So I really want to uh, be open to the idea there are many different so- soils. Um, but the, the problem of the, the sower is what, the, what are the different pieces of the puzzle that the sower is going to do? Still up there before we get to A is um, the sower is going to sow seed. That's you and I. I consider myself, I'm a mailman. All I deliver the, all do is deliver the mail. I don't write the message. God writes the message. I'm a mailman. All I want to do is deliver his mail. That's all I'm interested in is getting the word out. And I'll let the Holy Spirit do whatever the Holy Spirit does. I'm just going to deliver the mail. I'm privileged to be an ambassador for Christ. The ambassador isn't the president of the king. The ambassador, uh, uh, ambassador represents. It's not his message. He brings the message of the king. So I'm like that. I'm just an ambassador for Christ. It's, if I do it right, it's his message. And I need to deliver it faithfully as best I can. So that helps the change kind of piece. Um, and uh, so what, what's involved in this? We need the right seeds, the word, the word of God. The seeds need to be watered. The seeds, the way I understand the growth progr- progress is it needs sun. Um, it needs fertilizer. And it needs to be, the garden needs to be weeded, kept the bugs out. Um, in the light of this, we all need help. We all need counsel. I'm amazed at how many people resist counseling. Not so much now because it's kind of like in fashion, it's vogue. You know, kids love to have their own therapist. It saddens me when I see a kid in junior high, and I've heard of this story. It, says, it just breaks my heart. Hey, what are you doing after school today? I'm going to see my therapist. It's like, that's what teenagers, you know, junior high kids are supposed to be doing? Aren't you going out to play soccer or shoot baskets or play frisbee or something. No, I'm going to go see my therapist. It's like, wow. And I, I know people, you know, when they're having trouble with their young kids, especially because separation divorce is so prevalent today, when families are split up and uh, the mom calls up and says, I'd like you to work with my daughter. I said, oh, oh sure, uh, we can work with your daughter. How old's your daughter? Oh, she's eight. Um, what's going on? And uh, I find out the family's broken up and everything like that, and she's heartbroken. And uh, I, I don't want that. I want them to have innocence and normality, but it, it's, there's so much brokenness today. So I'm anticipating the obvious. And, uh, but as we grow in Christ, as we understand, I like to see what the Scripture says. You know, even when Adam was made and God said he was good, he still needed to help me. 
There's none of us that don't need. And, uh, you know, why don't we allow ourselves to receive counsel and help? Uh, I have a husband. He's very involved in, um, he's a techie. He's involved in multiple churches, doing a lot of work for the churches and stuff. Uh, he claims to love the Lord, but he, he doesn't need a counselor. He says, my wife, you, the wife, you need a counselor. Go get counseled. So the wife comes in and gets counseled, and she's describing the behavior of her husband, who uh, came out of the world, and, and, but he's really rough around the edges. And he says, I don't need counsel. And uh, he'll say to the wife, yeah, I have issues, but uh, so what are you doing with your issues? I'll tell you what he's doing with his issues. He's destroying his wife and kids, but he doesn't want to do counsel. And so when it first started, when I started being a Christian counselor, and, and uh, um, I don't know if I ever told you this, Pastor, but when I, we graduated from the same school, and uh, I knew in my heart of hearts, oh, I love pastoral ministry, and I don't mean, I'm not gifted to be a senior pastor, a lead pastor. It's not who I am. Uh, can I preach and teach? I don't know. You be the judge of that, but um, I, I'm not, uh, I knew I wasn't a visionary that saw where churches needed to go. My pastor that I had in the church that I had, uh, it was a healing ministry. It's a counseling ministry. What, how would you say that, Steve? Because the church I took, it has, it was under 100, but it was in a, a rural community out there in the Pinelands of South Jersey. And uh, what three administrations over 10 years had fallen into sin, different sins, embezzlement, infidelity. And so three times uh, the church failed. And when I went there, someone told me, you ought to go visit this church, you know, because I'm leaving the church that I'm in. I'm an assistant pastor. It's time for you to get out and go do your thing. So I go down to this church, and there were six people left. And uh, they had a debt of thousands of dollars. And I was bivocational, so I wasn't dependent on the need. And I went to that church, and I realized now when I look back, there was a church that needed counsel. They needed a shepherd's heart. I'm not so much the bishop. I can run a business, but I'm not the bishop in the church. I'm much more of a disciple or a shepherd or a nurturer of God's kids. So the church healed. I was there for six years, and it was wonderful. Um, they healed. The reputation of the church changed in the community. Uh, people came back. We got out of the debt. Uh, everything was great. And then I said... God, I don't know what to do. And God's message was, a year before I left, you've done what I wanted you to do. The church is healed now. It's time for you to go heal and, uh, or be used of God to heal. And I said, well, I don't know where to go, and I don't want to hurt them if I leave. And all their failures happened in the fall where churches exposed the infidelity between the pastor and the pianist and all that stuff. And, and so for, three, for, for 10 years, the holidays were hated. So I said, I can't. It was in August. It became crystal clear to my wife and I that, hey, it's time to go. I said, I can't resign now. It's the fall. That's the last thing we want to do. So God put it upon our heart. We'll resign in January after the, after the holidays. So uh, January I come, I resign. The holidays were great. We had a good time. And then I said, by the way, I'm resigning. And, uh, you know, but why? And so we go through it. But it was a healing ministry. And the next pastor that came in was more of a visionary pastor. He was the right man for that season. And by that time, there was a huge void of counseling. And so the counseling wasn't getting done. So um, it started off when missionaries are coming off the field. And uh, when missionaries come off the field, and if they get a sense that I'm safe, and I was very safe, I still think I'm safe, um, that they started sharing their problems of what was going on. And so I became, became the missionary's counselor. And then he went to the board and said, oh, I got this great pastoral counselor. And the next thing I know, I got this counseling load. And then, uh, so I started counseling, but that gets overwhelming. And then uh, I went for a, a residency, a CPE, clinical pastoral education at Abington Moral Hospital in Philadelphia. And uh, I learned an awful lot about the world out there. And uh, it helped me understand that God is bigger than my church. I thought God was as big as our church. And I found that he's bigger. I imagine that. It's one of those true truths I learned. And uh, God did wonderful work in me that year. And I got done that residency and I came back and, and there was this secular agency. It had about 40 counselors, uh, 12 steppers, you know, alcoholics and uh, lesbians and homosexuals and all kinds of different isms of the day. Pyramids and crystals and uh, just Ouija board stuff, just crazy stuff. And I met the director there and I said, how would you get your counseling center started? Because I'm thinking of starting a counseling center. Well, so he tells me a story. Why are you asking? I said, because I think God's called me to be a counselor and, and I'm going to resign the church, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he says, well, uh, what kind of counselor are you? I said, well, I I'm a born-again Christian, uh, King James only, devil-hating, praying kind of counselor. And uh, um, so I said, we don't have one of your kind. Would you, people call us all, up all the time. Do you have a Christian counselor there? And we had to say, why don't you be our Christian counselor? I said, I don't think your other counselors will like me. I mean, I'm going to pray against the enemy. And, I'm, I'm, and I said, oh, no, give it a try. So I uh, so, uh, uh, said, well, come in on a Friday night. Nobody's there. So he... <laughs> 
if I give you a room and a client, will you talk to him? So he talked me into it. And so I went there. And um, so I, I did this thing. And, and uh, the first week there was one person there. Second week there were four. Third week there were eight. I had to come in on a Saturday morning. My wife wasn't happy. Uh, and then before I knew it, no exaggeration, within eight weeks I had 40 sessions of counseling in a week. And not much has changed since. And don't you dare tell anybody because that's clinically inappropriate. And, but I don't know how to do anything else. I just do what God does. And it just seems uh, I just have a caseload, always have. And uh, I did go through burnout in the late 90s. And uh, uh, Earl Knowlton helped me through that situation. And uh, so I put up better boundaries. And I've been counseling ever since. But, uh, the, and the other counselors learned to hate me when they found out that I was a born-again, Bible-believing, counseling, praying, devil-hating counselor. And uh, they didn't. It, it, that's been changing ever since. So I've been doing that full time for a long time. And in the early days, when I went to my professors, Dr. Thornton and such, uh, I said, I'm going to open up a counseling center. He said, don't do it. You'll never survive. You know, Christians don't do that. And I said, but the Lord's put this burden on my heart. And so my wife, being who she is, knows me pretty good. And she said, Steve, you're never going to be okay if you don't try. That's all I needed. That was permission. And so then God, God did this thing. And then they asked me, would I speak to the community for free, open air lectures on Tuesday night? I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? Well, don't you have some kind of program? Well, I teach newlyweds how to be, and I found out everything I taught was useless, but, you know, 10 weeks of premarital counseling. So I just gave 10 lectures, and, you know, 100, 120 people from the community came out to hear me babble. And it, it just took off, and it hasn't been the same since. And, uh, but I would meet pastors and deacons and elders that needed counsel, but had a real tough time with counseling. And uh, I think I gave you a handout there in there somewhere about counseling. I, I think I did. Yes, counseling, counsel and counseling. This is what I believe in. I think it's so important for you and for me to have clarity and confidence in true truth. You know, in bold print at the top, it says, some said I don't believe in counseling. And that is said even to this day by some. The question has been asked, is counseling right for everyone? Is it necessary? And there are a bunch of different words in Scripture, some 20 different terms that are related over 200 times about counsel and counseling. And so I just, I'm not going to take time to read the Scriptures, but I encourage you, to, if you need any confidence, um, about uh, below halfway down, it says, Scriptures indicate that counsel should be received. Um, we should look for counseling, and it comes. Uh, next bold print says, Scriptures recognize that there is count the rejection of counsel. There are many that would not uh, listen to the counsel. They're not going to put up with it. They don't want to hear about it. They reject counseling. Um, but uh, counseling is something. Then they ask me, so well, you're just saying that because you're a counselor. No, 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 that's not true. I'm saying that. What came first, the wonderful counsel, counselor, counsel, or counselors? I began counseling because of the wonderful counselor and the need for his sacred counsel. I needed that. And there's a bunch of illustrations. Counseling is awful biblical. It's just there. There's safety in the multitude of counselors on this page a couple of times. We need counsel. And uh, now some people won't even look at the page, the handout you have, but I believe we all need counsel. We all need it. And so that's why I have counselors. Uh, besides the, the dozen that I work with, um, we're supposed to be involved in counseling one another. And people, especially men more than women, because women tend to be, generically speaking, I'm stereotyping, forgive me, um, but women tend to be more relational than men. And men, men don't relate. And I talk, you know, what kind of Christian are you? A biblical counselor? Do you do what the, you know, the Lord commands you to do kind of thing? And in, in the English uh, language, we don't see it as clearly as in the Greek language. Well, they're imperatives. It's kind of like it's a commandment with an exclamation point at the end. And God gives us a whole bunch of commandments on what we should do one with another. And I find we're not very Christian Christians. Uh, we think we're Christian Christians, but I don't think we are Christian Christians. Now, I'm setting this up, and I told Pastor, if I go down this stuff, I'm afraid Monday, I'm not going to be around. You're going to get all the phone calls. And so he said, let it rip. So we're ripping away at it. So now it, I'd encourage you from God, not dependent on the church or pastor or the elders or the deacons or who, board members, whatever it is, why don't you and Jesus get together and change, because this is the end of the change piece. Well, we're going to do change, so I'm going to grow and I'm going to be different. And if I'm going to be different, what's the difference that I need to be? So we're going to go down a checklist of one anothering. Um, uh, in the Greek, it's alelos. There's a word there. And I'll start with the script. I'm going to read this one. Lab. Two are better than one. Hey, men, I hate to be alone. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Uh, hopefully you're with me on the page uh, one anothering. I'm reading the scripture at the top. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. 
But woe to him that is alone when he falls and hath not another to lift him up. And if a man prevail against him that is alone, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm thankful for those that are praying for us today, and we need to one another. So I'm wondering, how many of these can you circle and say, yep, that's me, I do it. Number one, do we really love one another? Number two, accept one another. Three, greet one another. Four, be at peace with one another. Live in harmony one with another. I don't know how much contention. I hope there's no contention, but live in harmony with one another. Fellowship, that means share of yourselves with one another. Be kind one to another. I don't want to know in here who's short-tempered. Uh, that, you know, that's a tough one, so don't raise your hand, don't elbow. Uh, if you're short-tempered, you know it. Uh, just look in the mirror at yourself. Number seven, be kind to one another. Number eight is a big one for me, to care, to give care to For another one, who have you cared for well lately? Number nine, show compassion to one another. Uh, Not criticize and judge. We'll talk about that briefly as we come up to couples. And uh, Number 10, be gentle and patient one with another. Number 11, honor one another. See the value as Christ sees the value of your brother or sister. Comfort one another. Edify, build up one another. Doesn't say tear them down. Encourage one another. Speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do, do you nurture? Do you share scripture with each other? It's so, I love when people share passages. Oh, I just read this. It's a, and, I, and the last time I read in Ecclesiastes, it was a long time ago, so it's like new and fresh to me. Oh. Bear, 16, bear one another's burdens. You can't bear a burden if they haven't shared it with you, and that's why we have to share our burdens one with another. Suffer with one another. We're talking about suffering. Refresh one another. Rejoice with another. Submit to one another. You mean him or her? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Who comes to your mind when you say hey, there's someone in the church you need to be submitting to and honoring and valuing and edifying that you're not doing? Uh, I don't want to know their first name or their last, but I wonder if someone in here gets prompted, yeah, you know, I'm holding on to resentment, they left the nursery a mess, or, you know, they didn't pick up the paper, whatever. Uh, Submit to one another. Number 21, consider one another's better than ourselves. That's why you guys put me up on a pedestal. Uh, I, I have my gift, you have yours. My gift is no more different or better, but, and I'm so glad Pastor Kevin didn't get a whole bunch of pleasant platitudes because then my health head swells and I get full puffed up in ego and and, and then I, I fall. And so if you just know, I'm regular. I'm just like you. We're just different but the same. It's really okay. And so you're, you're a child of God. You're a prince or a princess, and I want to honor you that way. And so don't put me up above. That's kind of why I'm not up on a stage. Well, I guess tomorrow i got to be up on a stage or something in church, but Hey, man, we're all the same. You know, I put one shoe on at a time. I can't jump into both at the same time. Maybe you can, but we're just regular. Consider one another as better than ourselves. 22, serve one another. 23, show hospitality one to another. Who have you had over lately? Who have you blessed? Who have you brought dinner to lately? Pray for one another. Please do. Pray for me forever. Confess your faults one to another. Uh, Boy, oh, boy, do I want to be that transparent, vulnerable. The thing I've never told anybody I need to tell. Stop judging one another. Stop um, biting and devouring one another. Uh, stop, uh, speak the truth in love, not, preferring, not preferences or opinions. You know, your opinion doesn't matter. I don't care what color the carpet is, but the truth matters to me. Confront one another. That means you have to, well, should I say something? Yes, but do it nicely. Teach one another. Warn one another. Forgive one another. That can be hard. Pursue one another. That's where the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes out. There are a lot of bishops. One of the things about me, I could never be a senior pastor in one of those big churches because the pastor doesn't shepherd. He bishops. He organizes the church. He doesn't go out and chase sheep. I can't help it. I'm a cheese shaper. Uh, 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 Sheep chaser. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, I have a fellow who was in worship, and somehow he got in some trouble, and he resigned. And I'm still calling him up every few weeks. I say, yo, 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 could you call me back? And he's not calling me back. Can we meet for a cup of coffee? I don't want to show up at his workplace because he's not ready for me yet. But he, I haven't forgotten him. And uh, he used to play music for me when I'd go out and speak at uh, Cowboy Church and stuff like that. He, he was a musician. They loved him. He was great. And uh, he got in trouble, resigned, and, but uh, I'm not forgetting him. I'm going to chase him down until he comes around. I know his mom. Like, How's he doing? He hasn't called you yet, didn't text you back yet. I said, not yet. Uh, I'm I'm patient because I'm long-suffering. 
Okay, so uh, I'm not going to forgive him. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forget him. I'm going to, number 33, pursue him. I'm going to restore uh, as best I can, reconcile with one another. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh, we tend to do that. I hate it. Shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's not called growth. That's called death. But he that soweth to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Um, as we have opportunity, therefore, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good to all men. All, all. You know what scripture, all, you know what all means in scripture? Does your Bible mean all means all? A-L-L, all, all? I, I don't get God sometimes. What, what about, but they're bad guys and gals. No, 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 no. They're just a sinner like you. Esteem others better than yourselves. The lowest of the low. I will put them up. Uh, I'm going to call them for and sit them on the seat, man. It's a good thing. Let us do good to all, A-L-L, all men, especially to them who are the household of faith. So especially for you. Uh, I sh- I, when I go down that list, how many of those ideas can I say, yeah, I, I'm living that out. Now, w- when you don't throw this away because it's sacred material now that it's been done in church, so you've got to save this handout thing or grab one off the table. When you do that, uh, come Christmas, after all the gifts are open, you had all your last piece of pie, and you're thinking, so, oh, Steve said something about between Christmas and New Year's, where would my ministry grow? You can go down the checklist, where should my ministry go? And since I'm not that smart, I don't, well, I know I'm not doing this real good, so I'm going to go over to Pastor. And Pastor, I went through this checklist Silverstein left behind. I don't really like it, but I'm going to talk to you. I, I don't know how to do this. Could you help me figure out how I can grow this year? I'll bet your pastor would love to help you figure out how you grow. And he's going to have to pray for insight, discernment, and discretion, of course. But wouldn't it be great if you had a spiritual coach that independently got to know you? So what are you doing? Where do you think God's gifted you? Should you go on a missions trip this year? Do you want to go down to Carolina and help clean up some mud? Or go back six months later and and help rebuild their steps? You know, I I don't know what you're good at, but... Uh, I'm sure you can figure out some type of ministry that God wants you to grow in. Please don't be stagnant. Please don't deteriorate. Let's grow this year. I think it's a simple request, so that's what I'm going to offer to you. So that's a little bit about that, and let's see, where am I on the, tr- on the growth thing? Is that, that's a second handout, so that's good, so we can move on a little bit. Okay, now, as we go through that, we have our, our four L's. I want to give you the four L's for you OCD people. Because I'm that way. I, if I have an incomplete outline, it drives me crazy. <coughs> I'm just going to mention to what they are. Um, I did write some books at the bottom of the page. Um, and uh, I, I think I put one on yesterday. Revolution of Character by Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard just went home to be with the Lord. Tremendous man, tremendous book. Um, on developing the, the kind of walk in Christ I want, open heart, open, uh, open mind, open heart by Thomas Keating. Search for Significance talks about the four false beliefs many Christians struggle with. Instruments in the Redeemer's hands will expand the four L's that I'm talking about to you in a moment. And then when people are big and God is small, it's amazing how we let other people lord over our lives. All of them well work, works well worth the effort if I really want to grow and change. A, L, is love people. Um, do you really agape people? We're going to talk about agape again in a moment when we get into the marriage thing. Um, what, what is agape to you? What, what composes agape love? Because the English says L-O-V-E, and I don't think we have a clue what God's word says when it says agape. I don't know what agape means to you. What's that? I couldn't hear you. Self-sacrifice, that's of me, offer up at cost, sacrifice something that cost me. You know, I'll have some leftovers. I'll bring it over. That's not sacrifice. You know, I'll cook a meal, and I may have not have leftover for me, but I'm going to cook them a meal. That's giving of them without thinking of yourself first. So it's a self-sacrifice. But it's, it's a choice. You know, when God agapes us, he chose us before the foundation of the world. There's an intentional choice at cost. It cost him. It cost him significantly. It cost him dearly. It cost him enormously. It cost him to offer up his son. He, he watched the passion. He saw it. He saw the beatings. He wasn't blind to it. The son experienced it. The fa- you know, it's a sacrifice for the good of another. It's selflessness. And so if we're going to agape God, it's kind of like what I said yesterday. I have no rights. I don't deserve anything except hell. I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve any blessings. 
in any relationship. I don't deserve anything from my, my children. I've not been a perfect dad. I don't deserve anything from my wife. I've not been a perfect husband. I, I, I don't deserve anything. But some of us have this attitude of entitlement. Wait, you, you know, I'm your dad. You owe me respect. Now, God commands us that children should respect their parents, obey them, no question about it. But the, the dad, I don't know that I, I've messed up too much. I don't know that I deserve it. Um, I'm going to teach them that God commands them, and out of obedience for your good in a relationship with God, you, you better obey. That, there's a good thing there. But that, that's a big deal. But um, loving God's a big deal. It's a real big deal. Um, uh, so uh, also part of number A is loving people. And I could ask you as we use that illustration, are you loving people? You know, uh, do you love God and people? A, B, learning. Learn about people. Um, we're supposed to be anthropologists studying mankind. Uh, when, I, when I started off in counseling, I had three theologies in my mind. One is theology, the study of God. Number two, anthropology, the study of man. And soteriology, the study of the relationship between God and man, because we all need to be spiritually saved and, and, and sanctified. Soteriology is that fancy word that says the relationship between man and God. So if I got the theology with God right... You know, if I'm doing the God thing, whoops. The, the triangle represents the Trinity to me. There's God. And then we have man, you know. Happy man, of course, because we're happy. If we're in a right relationship with him, and it takes a cross to get there, salvation. Real simple theology lesson. I don't care what level of, uh, of schooling you're in. If you understand the Trinity... You understand the man, his creation, as best we can understand man in the image of God. And the relationship between the two, it takes the cross for us to get there. It's a big deal. So I want to learn about that as best I can, develop my understanding of what's going on. So B is I want to learn about people um, and know them well. And then C is I want to listen and speak to people. I want to have relationship if we continue our, our progress here then there are other people that God wants me to, to get in relation with, and they're not always happy. They need, if we're, if we're in a right relationship with God, we will have that joy and rejoicing and stuff like that. But he puts others in our life that won't have that, and he expects us to minister to them. We're ambassadors, remember? We're supposed to deliver the mail. It's not our mail, it's his mail. But in order to do that, when will people... When will people open their heart? When will they open their heart? When will, they, when will they share with you the things that's so shameful for them? You know, and people do that every once in a while. There's a, a, a woman not so young in my, in my office, and uh, she was talking about heart wounds, and she's kind of ashamed to share it. And uh, her mom, when she was a girl about getting into her teen years and starting to become womanly, and she's getting in there in those years, and her mom says to her, your sister is beautiful, but you're going to be a good mother. She said, what? Your sister's beautiful, and she'll be fine, but you're going to be mother, motherly. I had a father who was just confronted by his daughter. I may have shared this last night. Forgive me if I'm repetitive, but his daughter said, Dad, on my wedding day, you never told me I was beautiful. I didn't know that was a requirement. I'm glad. I, I, as far as I know, my, it didn't crush my daughters. I think I told them they were all beautiful because I thought they were, actually. And you know how men don't say what's on their mind? What would get us to open our hearts and begin to share those, those vulnerable things because the next time you get in a fight, you know, if, if my wife shares with me one of her dark secrets, well, I, I asked you to tell me everything before we got married. Of course she didn't. I um, thought she did. And then I learned these other things. And then uh, she, she reveals something very private and personal and, and hurtful from her past. And uh, in my stupidness, you know how husbands can get. And nothing about you guys, this one. Uh, but uh, when I do that, and so the next time we have an argument, go, oh, this is because of what you told me last week. When all of a sudden I'm using her most intimate, painful things against her in an argument, how dumb can a husband get? Pretty stupid. I was stupid. 
And you know something? What I did to double traumatize, then now I'm not safe. So what else haven't you told me yet, sweetheart? What I haven't told you is never going to get told to you because you're not safe. Oh, yes, I am. Right. So I'm, I'm so glad you husbands haven't done the stupid things I've done because my wife will remind me. I said, you remember last time you failed me? I said, no, I don't want to remember that. You know, yes, sweetheart, I, I get it. So are you going to do it again? No, no, never, never, never. And it takes a while to, retrust, to regain trust to take another risk. And uh, I've learned now, I, I think, as far as I know, I know everything. And I don't do that stupid anymore. Other stupids, maybe. Not that stupid. I don't do that stupid anymore. So it's really a challenge for people. People don't want to share with you their shame if, unless they really know you're safe. So you have to listen well if you're going to learn about the other people. It's a big deal. You need to love God. You, a, love God, love people. B, you need to learn about people through what the, what's the nature of man. And letter C, you need to learn the individuals. You need to listen and speak with other people. And uh, letter D is you need to labor. It's a labor of love. You need to labor with those people. It takes a conscious, intentional effort. It's a labor of love, and it's really a challenge. All right, so I finally got through. Can I change? I don't know if I can change. I don't know if you can change. I hope, hope we can change. Any thoughts, comments, or questions? Because I'm going to move on to other stuff. All right, let's move on to other stuff. Now, if I was good at technology, which you can tell I'm not good at technology, I would have done an Excel spreadsheet, which... I can't do. Um, so I used a, a word processor that went through email and got here. But there are a couple of blanks that I want to get to. And if you know anything about Steve, the blanks are the most important pieces. But I want to talk and set a stage. The rest of the page is, uh, is kind of a, a foundation to talk about that. Um, intimacy, the mystery of marriage. Uh, marriage is a mystery. It's a mystery between Christ and his church. And it's a mystery between us. I constantly tell people, and I, I'm, don't tell anybody I said this. this is, everything in here is private and confidential. All the stories I told you, they're my stories. You're not allowed to repeat them. They stay in here. I can tell my story. You tell your story. Don't tell my story anywhere else. So that's, this stays in here. Um, so I, I, as we go, th go through this, the, the, I am convinced, and I tell people, I don't tell them. I tell other counselors. You know, premarital counseling doesn't work. It just doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? Because... Their, their minds are, are, are completely useless. They're fluttered with all kinds of distractions. You know, tell me a man that's engaged that's not thinking about sex all the time. It's just not going to happen. Tell me a woman that doesn't plan on having this growing, intimate, conversing, uh, safe environment on the other side of the, the wedding altar. It's, it's just, you know, the women have such different expectations than men. Entirely different. And... Uh, uh, and I don't mean to be degrading to men or women. Uh, if you can trust my heart is good in intent, and I don't mean to be offensive. But uh, a lot of times we don't recognize the trauma of our past that we bring into our wedding and into our marriage. So I didn't know. I, I knew there were bad events in my wife's past, and she knew there were bad events in my past. But I had no idea what that would mean in a marriage. The baggage gets revealed. And I had no clue. I just want to live happily ever after. You know, I was thrilled. I thought my wife was beautiful, and I enjoyed her, and we only knew each other. We met really quick. Um, her mommy uh, introduced us in, like, February, and she didn't like men at the moment. She had just broken up with a, a college relationship. And so my, my roommate and I uh, thought she was rude, and she was. Uh, and so uh, we met in February and had nothing to do with her. And then in March, um, all of a sudden, we kind of became friends. She realized we weren't chasing her, we weren't after her. Uh, I wasn't very fond of her. I didn't think she was that nice a person. And Robbie, my roommate, thought she was really nice. So I said, good, have at her. And, uh, but she wasn't necessarily interested in Robbie. She was more interested in me. Why? I, I, to this day, I can't, she can't explain. I can't figure out. Um, but divine providence is wonderful. So... Um, I so we used to walk around a block at the, uh, at the end of the day. We became friends, and I was in the Word of God. I was trying to read the Bible, and, you know, and we'll talk about the Bible, and um, we prayed. Uh, it's funny how you can pray before you get married and how difficult it is after you get married. But, um, so we would pray. Uh, she, was, she was homeless at the time. Uh, her mother and father uh, broke up during that season. 
she was living with a church family. And uh, the church family lived on a, a, a street that was kind of, you could do a loop around, it was about a half mile. And uh, she had curfew, uh, you know, even though she in college. And uh, it was summertime. And uh, as we started walking around, I'm sorry, springtime, uh, days are long. And we're walking around the block, nice weather at night. We'd share each other's stories, get to know each other. So what you thinking about? Oh, I don't know, I was thinking about, you know, the park. Or, so what you thinking about? Oh, I was thinking about the birds. And so what are you thinking about? And I'm walking around after several different nights. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I started thinking about, uh, I wonder what kind of wife she would make. And then she asked the question, what are you thinking about? And I said, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you're thinking about. She, you know, she smacked me around. What are you thinking about? And I said, I can't tell you. So we walked around the second half of the park, uh, the, the, the street, and we parked right uh, under a street light right in front of the home she was staying, and we would sit on the hood of the car, and the kids that were living in the house would come out and play with us and everything, really as innocent as innocent could be. And so this time, the kids weren't around, so we sat on the hood of the car, and there's no kids coming out to play. And the light's not on yet, but it's going to get dark soon, and, and I'm thinking, and she's, you know, she's mad at me because I won't tell her what I was thinking. So impulsively, uh, ignorantly, naively, I said, I think I'm falling in love with you. How would you like to be my wife? Yeah. And she said, okay. <laughs> and then we never got to know each other. The rest of our relationship, we said, well, we got to go talk to the pastor, of course, you know, Jesus incarnate. And so he put his blessing. And uh, then uh, all we talked about then is what kind of wedding you want. We never got to know each other. Tell me everything about you. And, well, I think I want a white dress. Okay, good. And flowers, not a problem. So, but we never got to know each other. So we got married. Real, and I'm convinced now when you got married, you thought you knew each other. Oh, we've been dating for years. We talk about everything. And then the mystery marriage hits happens. Then you say the I do's, and you did. And then everything changes after the cake. I don't know what you expected on your wedding night if you're married or been married. I don't know what you expected, uh, what he expected on his wedding night. I don't know what she expected on her wedding night, but to yet, I haven't found a couple that said, I knew just what to expect, and it happened just the way I thought it would. I haven't met you yet. So if, you're, if, that's, if that's you, you can tell me everything working perfectly just the way you thought it would, but I haven't met that couple. There may be some couples in the country that do that, but he expected different than what he got. She expected different than what she got. That's a problem. And I didn't marry my wife for the right reasons. And maybe I was falling in love with her, but it's neat thing in Scripture. I think it's chapter 5, verse 1 in Genesis where God says, Adam knew his wife. And it's more than sex. I sincerely believe that. He became, there was very, you know, I know sin and everything, but there was nothing there but, then, but to get to know each other. And there's so much of Scripture that substantiates that. But after the wedding cake, everything changes. And you don't know what to do with your unexpected reality. Like, this isn't what I expected, so what do I do with unrealistic expectations? So after a few years, I started talking about wh what, how do relationships grow? How, how, do they, how do they happen? What goes on that makes a relationship a relationship? And uh, after this, I'll, I'll hang around. If you've got any insights for me, I'm all, all, all interested. Common relational development, the top left-hand corner says... There are common social experiences, you know, their encounters. When my wife was introduced to me for the first time, it was at a high school basketball game. The Christian Day School was playing against the faculty, and uh, so we got to meet each other. Went out for ice cream, and she left the table and never came back. Okay. Um, social, social, uh, social environments leads to emotional expectations. If I like her, I'm expecting her to like me back. But then commonly in the world, and this didn't have, thankfully this didn't happen in our relationship, because uh, I was in a legalistic church that has six-inch rule. Anybody know what a six-inch rule is? We grew up with a six-inch rule. So uh, it wasn't going to be a problem. So emotional leads to physical commonly. That's what happens certainly in the world, certainly in our, te in our teens today. And now progression is, you know, they, they, they meet each other, they fall in like, usually through texting or on the Internet, whatever that looks like, Facebook and stuff like that. And so they, then they get all excited and uh, then they uh, have sex and then they have kids and then they buy a house and sometimes they even get married. Divorce rate's going to be going down because no one's getting married. 
So that's the norm of our culture today in my community. I sure believe and hope and know that your community is so much different, but I'm not quite convinced of that. But social leads to physical, and when physical gets involved, number four, struggles with communication take place and intellectual development is hindered because of physical distractions. Would you rather have sex or would you rather like to talk about getting to know each other? I don't know any teenage boy I know would rather talk than have sex. I think they all want sex. So... Number five, spirituality is ignored. Number six, there'll be relationship breakdowns and heart wounds for both. I can't really remember how many, but I know it's regular. If a, if a woman has sex with a guy um, before marriage, then she feels obligated, well, I had sex with him, I, I should marry him, he should be my husband, because the only man I'm supposed to have sex with is my husband. So I can't tell you how many women have gotten married because they had sex before marriage and they felt obligated to get married. Not good. Not good. So that's common relationships. So now we look at the five different Greek words that kind of relate to the concept of love. We translate it. We already talked about agape. Agape is a choice to sacrifice for the good of another person. It's based on knowledge both of scripture and this other person that I'm going to choose you and I'm going to lay down my life for you. Number C, it's even when unlovable, it should be an unconditional commitment. And, you know, now more and more times, it's, I gave him six years and he didn't figure it out. So who told God, when did God tell you six years? I, I don't know. I, I had no clue what I was saying. I promise you, I didn't know my wife. I didn't know what I was saying when I married her. But I'm confident the pastor made me agree to, for better, for worse. We had some worse times. For richer and poor, we, when we were in seminary, we were dirt poor. For better, for worse, for richer, for sickness and health, my wife's had her physical needs. She's had multiple surgeries. She's okay today, I think. Forsaking all other, and I don't put uh, all others is more than another person. We're supposed to leave father and mother and cleave to our wives. You know, I can't tell you how many men I met that are enmeshed with their mommy. Uh, I was till I was in my 30s, married in my 20s, and I realized I'm a mommy's boy. I was, a, I was an immature, boyish man. I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant. Now I do. I'm trying not to be immature, but every time I, I still have relapses, I go back. I can, I can hear it in my voice. Steve, I say, uh-oh, I'm doing it again. What did I do? How do I fix it? How do I get back to adult Steve instead of boyish Steve? So I appreciate that. But it should be uh, unconditional, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all other. Does that mean opening day? Yeah. Of trout season, yeah. Not buck season, yeah. Well, what about the Super Bowl? Yeah. I don't know if I want to get married. Right. Now, I, I, in Numbers, I think it's 22, there's that passage of Scripture that when the Israelites, they had some insight in the Old Testament. They say that a husband, during his first year of marriage, do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? What's it say there? Don't go to work. Stay at home and learn how to make her happy. That's what Scripture says in the Old Testament. Well, I ain't going to war, so I guess I can go to opening day. You know, true story. If you know Jimmy Evans, he's on TV and radio. Jimmy Evans tells a story. Uh, I believe I'm telling the story pretty quick. See, my story stay here. I can tell his story. Don't you tell my story. Uh, he says to his wife, they're newlyweds, and he's a golfer. And he says, sweetheart, I'll talk to you all day. Pick up my golf clubs and caddy for me. I'll talk to you all day. Whoa. Well, God got hold of his heart. And he says, I'm giving up golf, took his golf clubs, threw it in the back of the garage, and it stayed there for three years of repentance and reconciliation and everything else. And after three years, uh, um, Karen Evans says to Jimmy, he says, uh, hey, it's Saturday. Why don't you go play golf? What? It wasn't about the golf. It was about everything else around that. Golf was his idolatry. Super Bowl can be my idolatry. Opening day can be my idolatry. It's got to be surrender, unconditional, without boundaries, for better, for worse, richer, poorer, sickness, and health, forsaking all other, till death us do part. And when I was growing up, part of my, I grew up with an older sister, and I meshed with my mommy, and my older sister's girlfriends thought I was cute. 
And so I, I bonded real well with females. Never had a boyfriend. Boys thought I was goofy. I had big goggle glasses, real thick when I was young. And I had, uh, in the 60s when I grew up, when everybody had hair, uh, you know, hair like these ladies here, and, and I, I had a military haircut, and I was, it was shameful. Why can't you grow hair? Why do you have goggles like that? And my mom was always afraid they'd fall off, so she had the athletic kind that would wrap around your ear. But she wanted it tight. I had sores behind my ears, so they stood out. And in truth, this is true, people say, you look like Howdy Doody. Now, the young ones won't know who that is, but us old folks, I looked at them because I was sunburned. I had the pink nose and cheeks. I looked like Howdy Doody. Buck teeth. I didn't get braces until I was in my teen years. Buck teeth. I sucked my thumb. I wonder why. And uh, goggle glasses, haircut, and everybody's wearing beetle boots, and my mom got me wingtips. What was my mom thinking? It was torturous. So very difficult. So now when I marry my wife, I have to have this agape thing. It's a choice of sacrifice for her good, not my own. B, it's based on knowledge. C, even when unlovable and it's an unconditional, even when my wife is in her ugly mood, don't you dare quote me, um, without expectations of anything in return. That means I give to give. When you give to charity... If you give to Samaritan's Purse, I don't expect anything in return. I just give. When I give it to church, I don't expect anything in return. I'm giving because God lays it on my heart. When I give it to church, I expect nothing. It's just I'm giving back what's already his. You know, he gave me the strength to, to make 100 bucks, and if I give 10 back to him, I'm just giving him his own stuff. I, I'm not going to cheat him out of it. It makes no sense to me. He, he could cause bills to grow up. He could take all $100 if he wanted to. But it just makes no sense. So for my wife, I, want, I expect nothing in return. You know, I, I, don't, I don't ask for sex because I brought home a paycheck. I, I don't, you know, whatever, whatever I did, I don't expect anything in return. Now, I used to have that attitude of entitlement. Wait, I'm the husband. I'm entitled to certain things. No, that's not agape love. Same thing with the wife. Well, I'd expect him to treat me nice. Well, I know you expect, and he should treat you nice, but agape love is without conditions. And that's That's hard. But that's Christian. That's like I'm asking about Christian Christians. This isn't easy. And I, I'm just going to ask you. Remember I started yesterday with God. Is the, the, you know, in the beginning was God. And it was God, God. And, it was, and it's his word. And we're going to talk about now some, and tomorrow morning, some very painful things that God tells me, commands me to do without conditions. Steve, this is what I want you to do. But, 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 but. And someone said after, after every but, what's of the devil. So forget about but, 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 but. And so there's no buts. It's just agape is without conditions. Second kind of love, of relationship, is uh, phileo love, friendship love, Philadelphia city of brotherly love. Uh, storge is the third word, bringing, uh, uh, it's that belonging, secure, safe love of a family. You know, I love my kids. My kids love being part of the family, hopefully. Um, uh, number four is that romantic eros love. And number five is, I think, what shows up in an awful lot of relationships. Epithumia, it's that f- selfish uh, carnal love, it's lustful. And we say, you know, the, the, the man says to the prostitute, I love you. No, he doesn't. He lusts her. He's, he loves the pleasure he's experiencing in the moment, but he doesn't agape her. And he doesn't, they're not friends. There's no security in that love. It's a business transaction. But he can scream at the top of his lungs, you make me feel so good, I love you, but it's lust. And we can do that in... In infidelity, and we can do that in a marriage too. Now, so, hey, so Doc, what do you want us to do? What do you recommend? Here's what I would recommend to our young people. And now I, I have no expectations before the alt- marriage altar that this is the way it's going to be. I have no expectations. But this is what I think ought to be. So when people uh, do this, n- recommendations, n- number one is what we always want to do. We want to focus on the spiritual. And how do you do that? Uh, we've talked about some things. How do you get spiritually minded? How do you know if you're living the, Christ, the life Christ wants you to? There's a lot of one anothering that ought to be going on by Christians in the church. Number two, learn effective relationship skills. Reflective communication, learning how to have compassion, as we talked about in the first session. Uh, you know, the God of all comfort comforts us, comforts Paul, who comforts us, and we're supposed to comfort others. Um, number three is repetitive, gain understanding of people. Number four is huge. I hope I would know another person, not romantically uh, distorted in my thinking, but to choose someone you wish you could help reach his or her full potential. I would love to have married my wife. I sincerely mean, I wish I had married her thinking 
This is going to be a long, tough journey. But I care about this woman enough that everything I do is going to help Kathy reach her full potential in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, where it says the husband's supposed to wash the wife with the water of the word, I wish I didn't use the word of God to condemn her. I wish I learned how to nurture her heart and challenge her to be all Christ intended her to be. So I didn't marry her that way. I wish I had. I learned to get to that place, but I wish I had chose someone that I, my intent was, I'm going to marry you with the intent is I'm going to help you be the best Kathy you could ever be. Next thought, number five, I would choose someone that I would believe would help Steve reach his full potential in Christ, that she would support me. It's not just, well, you're not going to be okay if you don't give it a try, but I believe in you. You know, I would want someone to help me reach my full potential in Christ. Now, every stupid thing I've ever done that I've realized and I've confessed and I've repented, I've asked for forgiveness, I've reconciled and restored relationship, uh, you know, all of that I'm hoping will help me get gooder and gooder and gooder. It's more close to being the God's child that God intended me to be. That's what I think we ought to aim for. And I don't know that we talk to our children. You know, when you grow up, you know, they're pretty girls. There's good-looking guys. But more than looks, this is something that you and I, what we pass on to them, this is what we ought to be looking for. I think it's the best way I know how to express. But I'll tell you what, number six is that if I really do choose someone, um, I'm still going to be attracted to that individual. Number six, confront fleshly attraction with genuine relationship principles. And one of the greatest thing I have right now is good accountability. I have a brother in Christ that I can talk to whenever I struggle, and I do. I have a men's group that I can talk to. We meet every Friday morning before we go to work, and I can talk, and I can share the truth about me and my journey. We share about, uh, we're there together for an hour and a half. Sometimes we share burdens for 20 minutes and pray for 10, and I got a report because I wasn't there, so I kind of phoned in because I'm still accountable to those guys, and they said, Prayer time took uh, almost an hour, and then we got to a half an hour, and we only got through three verses of our study in 1 Peter chapter 2. I said, you got through three whole verses? Cool. But they spent an hour, and they, pr- they said, we prayed for you during the hour. Thank you, guys. I love you bunches. Hey, Steve, we love you too. Accountability. I, I absolutely need that. And without that, who would I share my struggles with? And they know, that they know more details than they need to. And they don't need to know details. And I don't, need to know their, I don't need to know the details of your marriage to know that you're regular and you're going to struggle with this stuff. So that's it. So now, as we go through this, um, I see a progression of relationship on the bottom coming across. The progression is, you know, the people that we, we come across, but they're, they're really strangers. We don't know who they are. But if we see them often enough, sometimes they can be an acquaintance And the more time we spend with them, there'll be this casual relationship that develops. Might even know names. Sometimes they become friends. And if it's the opposite gender and we're in that right season of life, then they'll be uh, dating friends. And then uh, the idea is a a fully intimate marriage love relationship. Marriage love meaning all all four kinds of love without much lust in there. That's the goal. That's what we're after. So... How does that happen? So what's it look like going down the left-hand column? There's social relationship. There's emotional relationship. There's physical relationship. There's intellectual relationship. And there's a spiritual relationship. So which one, how do, I, how do relationships, how do we know if they're in balance or not in balance? How do we know if we're maturing? How do we know if we're, we're going through these different elements that make us up of a, a whole human being in the image of God? Because God is social, emotional, intellectual, uh, you know, it, it's not physical, sexual, uh, but spiritual. Um, so as we do that, if we're going to be a stranger socially... Um, there's no real connection. You might see the same person at the same Wawa, you know, go in about the same time. Say, oh, yeah, I recognize that, that hot rod motorcycle. He was here yesterday. Um, and a couple of days down the road, you might be, you know, we, we see other, hey, you know, that's a nice, nice Harley you got there. You know, uh, I see you riding a few times. Yeah, the weather's good. It's turning bad. Well, I won't be able to. But, so, you know, they're a stranger. You, you don't really talk to them much about it. Um, uh, emotionally, there's no real emotional involvement at that point. Um, and physically, they'll be light. You know, if you meet some, if you see somebody at church, you don't even know who they are, but you're walking at the same time, and you say good morning, open the door. So th- there's minimal actual physical contact. Um, uh, intellectual, after a while, you might say, uh, so how long have you been going to this church? Uh, someone just uh, indicated there are new members here, and so uh, okay, uh, well, you know, I'm me and you're you. And spiritually speaking, there should naturally be automatically. 
there should be an agape thing going on. That God has this person crossing live paths with me, and automatically I ought to be choosing to sacrifice, let them go in the door first. That's not really a sacrifice, Steve. I know, I know. But there's one cookie left, and you make sure they get it, okay? So that was a huge sacrifice. You get the idea. Even strangers, we should be willing to care for another, because even though we are strange to God, God cared to lay down his life for you, the son, the daughter of, in the beginning, God, God. It's a big deal. So we should be willing to agape for anybody, for strangers, um, under all circumstances. Uh, acquaintances. So what's the difference between a stranger and acquaintance? Uh, we, we socially cross paths a little more frequently. You know, not all the time, but, and we say, hey, how you doing? Fine. Inter-. The two words in, in counseling session that are like bogus, a band. I said, how, how's it going? Oh, fine. I said, no, 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 no. Fine stands for frustrated individuals with negative experiences. <laughs> so uh, tell me about your negative experience. I don't want to hear this fine stuff. Or if you, you know, when you confront them and, you know, well, that's interesting. I, I don't care about interesting. Define interesting, will you please? Because those are ricochet words. And, and some people say, well, they're fine. They said they're fine. So what do you expect me to do with that? Go further. Go further. Just tell them Steve's silly joke of fine stands for frustrated individuals w- with negative experiences. So uh, how, what was your negative experience recently? And so, so you have a way in, you know, I say, blame it on the, the counselor that came, you know. He was there that Saturday morning, he taught me this thing, uh, don't blame it on me. He said, uh, I have to agape you, so here we go. And I say, I don't, I'm glad I wasn't there that Saturday morning, see you later, uh, I'm out of here. But I would love you to get past fine and interesting. The follow, some people get a, a, an initial wall, and I'm convinced people want to be known, people want to be loved. Uh, I want to love and be loved. It, growing up in my childhood, I was very alone and isolated. Even I got some attention from my mom. My sister was my biggest abuser by far. Um, she, she, my dad was never around, so he didn't beat me. He just rejected me when he had opportunity. But my sister was the neighborhood bully. I was safe in the community because skinny little Steven uh, with the glasses and the buck teeth and the sun, you know, all that stuff, st- nobody in the neighborhood would pick on me because my sister would whoop him. I was a private punching bag. Nobody else was allowed to have a turn. And now in my adult, now it was, it's got to be 10 years ago. I, I was just in an intimate moment with my sister and, and we're talking about the past. And I'm saying, do you, do you remember, you know, beating on me? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I remember. And I, and I remember hearing my mother tell my sister, I, they didn't know I was listening in. My mom is telling my sister, you better stop hitting on Stephen. Why? He says, he's growing up, and one day he's going to hit back. So I, I clicked. And she, you know, my sister poo-pooed the idea, but uh, I remember that, and uh, my mom's gone, my sister's babysitting, and we're downstairs. We have split level, so we're downstairs, and I don't know what I did, but I know my sister's ready to beat on me again. So I ran up to the kitchen, went around the hallway, and ran up to the bedrooms, got top of the bedrooms, and I'm remembering. Mom said, Stephen's going to hit back one day. And she used to beat on me. And I said, wow, this could be, I'm going to hit her back. I, I didn't think about the consequences. So literally, I run up that flight of stairs, and I put my, my fists up like I was going to get her. She turns around fr- through the kitchen, comes up the next flight of stairs, and she looks up at me, and she stops dead in her tracks. I'm saying, I'm going to hit her. And she says, Mom said you'd do that one day, so I'm not going to hit you. I wanted to hit her. I wanted my turn. She'd been beating on me for years. I just wanted one turn. I could hit her back. And she walked away, and she wouldn't give me the chance. I have never been able to hit my sister. <laughs> it's truth. It's truth. I want to be able to do this. So she said to me, she said, in recent years, you know, Stephen, every time I beat you up, you deserved it. Really? Do I have any baggage? Can I just hit her now and get it over with? My sister's only five foot, but she's still tough. But I'm not afraid of her anymore, and she's still a bully. She can't bully my wife or children, though. That, that was a war. But I didn't get a chance to hit her, but she won't bully us anymore. And uh, very accomplished professionally, but boy, she, she was married once for three months 
And I, I was for too afraid to ask her what happened. But years later, I said, what happened? And her face turns red. She's still unprocessed, unpacked all this baggage. And she says, he just wouldn't do what I told him to do. I sent him home to his mother. Now, does that cast a shadow on my dysfunctional family? Okay. Now, how do you share that when you're getting ready to get married? Do you tell your wife, I'm a mommy's boy? I don't think so. That doesn't, I, didn't, I don't even know to share that. So that's interesting. Okay, on acquaintance, infrequent, cliches, fine. Uh, emotional connection, none. Uh, physical, polite, handshakes, open a door. Intellectual, minimal, you really don't know anything. Unless they're wearing a Boston jersey, then you know something about some people when you're wearing a red sock jacket then you, you know we really you don't know anything about these acquaintances um, yet God still count, challenges us to agape people uh, next level uh, casual relationship occasional not personal kind of like church relationships I think um, uh, not personal we talk about other people never talk about ourselves um, emotional is uh, you know minimal emotional involvement uh, distant you might shake hands you really don't get close uh, affectionately intellectual generally accepted as we can agree on what we can agree on uh, you know, we stay away from those hot issues, never talk about politics or religion, which are the only things I ever want to talk about. Um, and then uh, when it comes to casual friendships, we'll, we'll see that there's agape love and some phileo friendship love. There ought to be some friendship that's growing there. Going on further, when we become friends, as we become friends, there's a more, much more regular. We see each other all the time. We're feeling safe. We're being polite. And so there's regular social interaction. Emotionally, we begin to share personal feelings about other people. So share comes into the first blank and uh, share personal feelings about others. And uh, so we'll talk about others, but we take minimal risks, minimal risks um, as we go through that. And I know that's a little confusing the way that paper is, but I hope you'll bear with me. So share personal feelings about others with minimal risks. Physically we'll be polite. That's where hugs come into play. You know, you can have, uh, when I shake some guy's hard hands, uh, I'll put my arm around another man and give him a man hug. I teach all my grandchildren how to shake hands and put a double tap on the back. That's what men do. Hey, man, boom, boom, that's good. That's what you do. No more, no less. Um, so that's how, when you have a good friend, that's what you do. Um, and I don't hug women anymore. Um, that only gets me in trouble. And some women, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I come from a Jewish background, so a Jewish mom, oh, come here, I want to give you a hug. I said, hug your husband. He hasn't had one in years, so hug your husband. You don't need hugs from me, so that way I don't hug. It's, women are beautiful and very desirable, so I stay as far away as I can. I have no gal friends ever anymore. I learned how to, when I became manly years ago, that, why do I need gal friends? Learn how to be a man. Be manly man. The reason why men didn't want to hang out with me, because I was still boyish, but I didn't know it. I was clueless. I was deaf, dumb, and blind, so now I like manly friends, and I just don't hug women. What's wrong with that? Why do you need a hug from me? You know, let, let's go. And I hope your grandkids hug you really good, uh, but that's just so much safer for me because I can get myself in trouble. You women are too sweet, and, uh, if, and I tell, your, believe it or not, your husband thinks that about you or he wouldn't have married you. Now, no matter what the struggle or strain is, uh, guys still want to have a, a close, intimate, loving relationship with their wives. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, so... Uh, friendships, fair perso share personal feelings about others, minimal risk. Uh, physical can be uh, warm. And we begin intellectually begin to share uh, ideas and opinions and judgments, usually about other people, sometimes ourselves, but there's that progress. Are you willing to... Now, if my wife disagrees with me, does that make her wrong? Not necessarily. You know, different is different. It's neither right nor wrong. It's different. Um, there's a, a great program out by Emerson Egerich. It's called Love and Respect. If you've not heard, it's well worth the uh, investment. Uh, it comes in DVD form. It can be a home Bible study. It can be a church study. I, I hope Pastor and you guys would approve of it. It's great on conflict resolution. And he says it's neither right or wrong. It's just different. Uh, men think different. Uh, he's got some great information for us. And so uh, it's okay, right or wrong, not necessarily. Uh, it's just different. Some people like the ocean. Some people like the mountains. It's just different. Some people like both. It's just it's okay. Um, so we can share that. And as that uh, grows uh, a little bit for, uh, closer, um, uh, then spiritually speaking, um, there should be an agape always. A phileo love, some security and trust. Can, I, can you trust your friends? 
And uh, there's a commitment. Our, our men's group, I have no doubt if any of us, uh, there's usually five, six, or seven there. Uh, if any of us had a need, uh, I have no doubt the, uh, they'd be there. The rest of the group would be there for me. I'd be there for them. I, I would take a day off of work. I'd do what I had to do. We'd be there for each other. we trust each other with our hearts, with our families, and we, we would learn to do that. Um, that's treasure, and it needs to be done. Um, there's some books I listed at the bottom. Gary Thomas uh, wrote the book Sacred Marriage and Tim Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. Great, great first works. I'd also, uh, I think uh, in your copy, there's a couple others. Uh, we're going to get to, um, uh, let's go on in the outline before I get down to some other references there. So, uh, Dating relationships. Uh, you, you just want to be together all the time. I don't think that's healthy. There's a book out. I can't remember the author's name. It says, when a, when a couple spends 300 hours together, you cross lines. That's what he says. Research says. 300 hours is, by the time you're together for 300 hours in an exclusive relationship time, you're ready to cross lines. And most couples do. So in my mind, be careful how frequent and frequent, how much alone time do you have. Can you be in the room with, uh, can you sit at the kitchen table and have a, a cup of tea or a, a iced tea together with others where it's not exclusive intimate time? Can you do that? And if you're n- up at the top half, if my intent is to learn enough about this woman that I'm about to marry so I can commit myself to laying down my life and loving her as Christ did the church, can I help? her be everything she's supposed to be in Christ, I don't need to be alone in a conversation with her. If she's interested in helping me the, be the best Stephen that I need to be, if that's the goal, she doesn't need to be alone with me to do that. We can learn about each other. And what our family can tell us about each other, we may not want to believe, but it's probably true. They may know us better than we think that they know us. So dating is frequent. Sharing your feelings about yourself. You take much more risks, which gets us in trouble. So sharing feelings about yourself much more risks that will get you in trouble and then during the dating relationship uh, it should be pure it should be non-arousing how do you know when sex becomes sex how how do you know what's the largest sex organ we have it's between your ears sex happens up here our body responds but sex starts up here when you look, you get attracted, you get aroused. You know, so how far is, is it okay for our teenagers? Are they allowed to hold hands? Can they put their arms around each other? Can they hug? At church where it's pure, can they hug at the parking lot or at the front door or down in the family room? Can, can they hug? Is that okay? Um, uh, a question came through email this morning, actually. It says, when has sex become sex? Is, is sex sex when it's intercourse? When sex becomes sex? Is it sex before that? So I, I, I get these couples coming in, and uh, I can almost tell which ones have already slept together and had sex and all that stuff. And I said, you know, I, I'm kind of like this Christian guy, and I really want fidelity and purity. And, you know, you may, and I just give them the benefit. You, you may have crossed some lines, and uh, you can tell, uh, and usually... Uh, the woman will express grief quicker than the man will, or he will too. He'll be a little ashamed. Because, uh, you know, when, when you have sex during the dating, then what you're doing is taking something that doesn't belong to you, that God had sacred, and you're, you're taking and stealing from something you shouldn't be taking. And, and uh, God, so I believe there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. I can't believe God's happy with all this. So when does sex become sex? And I tell him, I just go through and say, well, you know, you, you know fondling, you know, if you don't take any clothes off, is it sex, you know? It, 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 or can you take off some clothing or, or, or just the top half or, just, or can you get naked and it not be sex when sex becomes sex so I have a real simple answer I just believe and I'll talk to you publicly or privately I believe sex becomes sex when there's arousal I go to biology class and you know we, we have you know see sex between you know two animals or something like that or cows on the farm or whatever it is it's like, is that sex yeah it is but it's not sexual for me. There's no emotional arousal. I believe God intended for man and woman to enjoy the pleasure of arousal as husband and wife. So I, I asked him, well, what do you think? You know, it, it, did God make that excitement, that pleasure, that arousal for husbands and wives? Well, yeah. I said, is it sexual? Yeah. So I said, well, it's real simple then. 
If there's no sexual arousal, you can do anything you want. But if you're becoming aroused, sexually excited, you're over the line. What? Think about it. You just agreed with me that God wanted passion, arousal, sexual excitement. He wanted that for marriage. You just agreed to that. Yes. Well, if that's happening, then you're over the line. But I'm not touching her. Well, you know the story about Jesus. What did he say? If you look on a woman with, that, that's that lust thing, epithumia, with that desire in your heart, you're over the line. You've committed adultery in your heart already. How pure do you want, how, you know, how faithful do you want your wife to be? How faithful do you want your husband to be? You know, is he allowed to lust after other women later? Well, no! So well, why is it okay now? He's not married. He doesn't have that privilege and right. There are no rights. He doesn't have that yet. So my conversation early on is that if you don't get sexually excited and around, you can get excited, not sexually excited. You know the difference. There's, I hope everybody in here, I, I believe sincerely, everybody here knows what it is to be sexually aroused. If you're sexually aroused and you're not married and it's not with your wife, you're over the line. Disagreements? I mean, I, I just can't seem to get someone to give me better clarity. So do whatever you want. You can hold hands. Her hands are cold. Warm them up. Yeah, you can hold hands. She's freezing. Can I hug? Yeah. Are you aroused? No. When you hug your mom, you're aroused? No. Okay. So you can do that. You know, if you start taking her clothes off, are you aroused? Oh, yeah. Can't do that. Whoops. Whoops. And I'd even be careful. And even uh, passionate kissing, you know, French kissing. Is that arousing for you? Oh, come on. Wait till you're married. Can you give her a peck? Go, peck away. Be a chicken. I don't care. But that's, that's where the line comes. So now as we go down, under dating, we have frequent social relationships. Emotional connections are really going off the charts. You're aroused, physical, pure non-arousing. TLW, true love waits. True love. Because what's going on in a dating relationship is I want you. I want to have you. I want you to have me. True love waits. FLT, false love takes what doesn't belong to them. That's what I believe. And I'm open to criticism because I can't prove that from Scripture, but I believe it with all my heart at the moment. And so what do you do? Well, take a cold shower, go bake a cake, you know, go play around the golf, do something else, but get her out of your head, get him out of your head. And when, today, women are so, it's a woman's generation. Women are promoted to be so forthright, and uh, women can just take what they want. So uh, women, and women don't respect the marriage ring. You know, they don't. But, you know, every affair, well, I should say every affair, most affairs uh, involve the opposite sex. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. And I don't, I, my dad was a big flirt, and he taught me how to flirt. So growing up, I learned how to flirt. I connected with girls all the time. I love to flirt. One of my greatest thrills is, you know, what girl, give me a challenge. Which girl, pick one out. I'm going to see if I can't get her to uh, blush. I love getting girls to blush. Pick one out. Let me see if I can get her to blush. That was a challenge. And more times than not, I figured out how to connect with a girl heart to heart and get her to blush a little bit. Ooh, that's powerful. And then that gives her an emotional attachment with me. That's dangerous. And that's what I don't, I need to make sure I don't flirt anymore. And I used to say, I, my dad said, I'm just looking, I'm not touching. It's not. No, my wife was possessive. I don't want you flirting with other girls, flirt with me. Oh, I never saw my dad flirting with my mom. He said, well, I'm not your mom, am I? You're not sleeping with your mom at night, flirt with me. Oh, I never thought of that. Time to think. Dumber than dumb. I've done it all wrong. I want you to do better. And what are you going, how can you pass on to the next generation if you don't learn some, some things about that? So I really want you to do that. So then, intellectually, you have a growing disclosure, a healthy relationship. You have a growing disclosure. You'll be exploring each other and developing resolutions. How do you, how do you solve problems? And that's where, under spiritual, you do the agape, the phileo, the storge, and a commitment with unconditional acceptance. You know, I'm committed to you, and I accept you as you are, not how I want you to be, not how I think you are. When I discover the rest of you, I have this commitment that I'm going to accept you without qualification. Marriage, marriage then, 
Uh, how is our social? Co could, should be continual. And I hate texting, but it seems to be like the most uh, convenient way to connect with my wife. It's so inadequate. Voice to voice is way better, but sitting down and talking to her is the ultimate. Regular, fully open, honest, with disclosure, acceptance, and reassurance. You know, when I, and men don't get this, if we become vulnerable and we share our most intimate stuff with them, we figure it's like that old ugly little boy, the, the old uh, uh, kid with the buck teeth and, and you know, um, howdy doody kid. Well, that howdy doody kid never wanted to share that howdy doody experience with his wife because then she'd look at me like I was howdy doody. And yes, my hair wasn't that way. And yes, I didn't wear my grandfather's wingtip shoes anymore. And yes, 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 I was so different. But it was so intimate and so violating to me about my nature. I didn't want to share that stuff with her for fear she would reject me. Now, what I found out with men that love their husbands, and I'll qualify that with men, with, I'm sorry, with women that love their husbands, and not the men that love their, but women love their husbands, I'll get those dentures right yet. So I don't have them yet. So they're coming soon, I guess. But when women love their husbands and they hear the pain of my childhood, that's what, remember that we talked about the suffering and pain because this is suffering pain in marriage. This is the, op and it's confusing and nobody taught me this before. So, but when I share that intimate stuff with my wife, that's when she has her most tender-hearted compassion for me. That's when she, she has that, that adoring look in her eyes. Come here, Steve. Would a hug, Steve, would a hug help you? Not like something she's trying to take from me, but something she's offering. You know, would a hug help you right now? And I feel so dirty and ugly and lovable and undesirable. You know, are you sure you could stand to give me a hug, this ugly person that you're stuck married to? You know, and we belittle ourselves and we put ourselves down. But my experience for women is that they love to love on their husbands, especially when they're hurting. We don't want to admit that we're hurting. So we're not willing to be intimate. And when we go that way, then the sexual intimacy, then I know him, then I know her. And when we become vulnerable and transparent, then there's that heart-to-heart -heart connection. And when there's that heart-to-heart -heart connection in the brain, the big sex organ, then the body responds. And when we fall in love, and this, is, this progression is, well, how do you fall in love? This is how you fall in love. You look for the good of another person. You use different aspects, agape, phileo, eros, you know, um, uh, storge. Uh, when you look at that and you begin to spend quality time and you begin to, how can I help you be the best you could be? And I'm, I'm willing to give up the Super Bowl game because you're way more important. It, it, the things of this world grow strangely dim, was written. But you're what's important to me and connecting with you. Is, and, and then you come, become desirable. And uh, I, I believe marriages are supposed to be filled with desire for each other rather than an inconvenience. That's not the way it's intended. And I, I believe men have a natural desire to want to be with their wife sexually. I think God's given us that sex drive. You know, w women can, but normally 80% uh, of the men are in marriages where uh, they're chasing their wives around the table. The wife's not changing. There are 10 to 20% of the women that will chase their husband around the figuratively speaking. And so men are more desirous of sexual intimacy than women, generically speaking, in my experience w with couples. So I think God gave me that desire for Kathy so that I would long to be with her. So in my loneliness and long to connect with her, she winds up uh, wanting to be intimately emotionally, intellectually. She wants to connect mind to mind, heart to heart, not just body to body. So she wants this stuff. So Marriage is continually. Uh, emotionally, there should be regular, full, open, honest disclosure with acceptance and reassurance. I want her to tell me, well, you just turned me one of those deepest things in your heart and you felt so ugly and undesirable, and I desire you for that. Um, physical should be mutually satisfying, fulfilling for both. And I'm not talking about those silly blue pills. I'm talking, if there's a hard heart, I'm, most of the couples I work with are not interested in connecting intellectually or emotionally, just, they just want sexual gratification. You know, he just wants to get off, and she just wants to stop being bugged. And she has been, it's been a long time for her to have that mutual satisfaction. And guys, because they don't know how to control themselves, you know, she's left wanting. It's been, well, I'm glad you were happy, but, you know. And then wives go, it's a terrible thing. It's, I, I think it's sexually abusive. I don't approve of wives saying, well, you can have a quickie tonight. 
that's so demeaning. I don't want you to be a sex toy or a sex object. And men that aren't willing, I think it's more of a will. And act, your wife, read what it says in Ephesians. It's a two-way street. You know, you're, if you're depriving your wife of the pleasures God designed her body to enjoy, you're cheating her. It's not she's cheating you. It's, I tell men, if you're not able to learn how to please your wife, you're the one that's short, in the shortcoming. You know, they say, well, I couldn't help it. Yes, you can. You haven't done your homework. And that, I believe, men haven't been taught how to be loving. They're taught to how to be sexual. You know, watch porn. You'll see how sex works. But you're, they're not taught to being a copying. I, I want to bring pleasure for the pleasure of my wife. Remember I said what the theme is? I want to live a life so that I can help her enjoy everything God inter- intended her for her to enjoy so she can grow in Christ and be everything God intended for her. Women like sex. I'll rephrase it. Women love to be loved and treasured and, and cared for. They don't like sex. They like love. So you know, are you making love or having sex? And in the church of all places, I would think you should learn how to make love and not have sex. I, I, I don't want to. And I, I remember the time. This is truth. I, my wife's not here, which I'm glad for. But uh, um, she, she would be honest in telling you. I remember the day where we're starting to get romantic. And uh, um, she had already been complaining that, you know, she, Steve, you're being selfish. You know, I'm really not enjoying this so much anymore. And I'm, I, and I'm intellectually getting the data. And I'm saying, you know, I just don't want to ever have sex with you again. I want to learn how to make love. Yeah, Steve, we've been through that conversation enough times. I said, I need your help. I said, oh, yeah, like what am I supposed to do? Well, when we start off being romantic and I'm really into you, um, you know, and I'm caring for you, uh, you know, that's great. If you discover that during this act of, of romance and sexual activity that you sense that I'm beginning to think of myself instead of think of you, I want you to tell me. You don't mean that. So I really, I do. I do. Give it a try. So let's see what happens. So, you know, a couple of weeks goes by and things start up. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm centered, you know, okay, okay, this is a gift to my wife for her pleasure and her enjoyment, and I'm pretty centered. And uh, things get going. And after a little while, you know, this is, I love you, sweetheart, I appreciate all you do, blah, blah, you're beautiful, blah, blah. And then she goes, Stephen, in that other voice, what? And she says, who are you thinking about? She was right. She says, I, I don't know, it's, it's her story. She says, I could tell when you stopped thinking about me and started thinking about yourself. And so I stopped. And she said, where are you going? I don't know, but I'm not okay. Come on, let's finish. Nope. Yeah, right. No. So I left a moment, and I was heartbroken because she caught me in the act where I became selfish. And that's not okay. And she was tolerating that wrongly, is what I would say. We're not teaching our young men how to fall in love and administer sexually to our wives. We're not telling them anything. So they do what they see in the theater, you know, or on TV or wherever else. And it's like, you know, wham, bam, thank you, man. And the women on TV, you know, there's a great uh, story by um, Lewis. uh, What's his first name? Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, on masturbation. And uh, there's a quote there when he talks about masturbation, how that brings you to focus on yourself and all your imaginations. Everything's perfect. It, it just what you fantasize about when you're masturbating is all about yourself. And you know, she loves you and adores you. She craves you and all this stuff. And what it does, it creates an imagination that no real woman could ever match. Because sex is supposed to be that ministry for the pleasure of another, not selfish gratification. And he says how that poisons uh, romance for, for men and women. And so, uh, sure enough, I, I, I apologize, I repent, my wife's trying to minimize it, and I'm, I'm devastated, I can't believe what a pig I am. And so, uh, sure enough, a couple of weeks goes by, and we start up again, and uh, sure enough, um, I, my mind starts wandering unknowingly, and she did it again. Stephen, guilty as charged, guilty as charged. So it has been an act of intention for me to learn how to appropriate love my wife instead of trying to get selfish pleasure out of it. And it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. But if you don't struggle, because no one's taught us. The problem is we have so many years of bad history that it's not a mutually satisfying, intimate love relationship. Did you get all that? Mutually satisfying, intimate, loving, phileo, agape, storge, eros relationship, a truly loving relationship. 
by meeting legitimate desires. And sex is not any mental. I need sex. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Men say, I need sex. No, you don't. Well, you know, I don't want to burst. I said, there's never been a man that's burst. God has made it very, he designed our bodies. We will never explode. You do not need sex. You don't. That's early on. Men, sex addicts think they need, you know, like they need heroin. I need sex. If I don't get it at home, I'm going to get somewhere else. You don't need sex. You're believing like, remember I said true truth? That's a lie. I long for sex. I desire. I'd rather have love than have sex. But I would believe in that last column. How do, you, how do you do that? Marriage, continuous social, fully open, honest disclosure with acceptance and reassurance. You're okay. I love you just the way you are. You don't have to pretend to be somebody you're not. Mutually physical, mutually satisfying, fulfilling love relationship. Intellectual, continually based on growing knowledge and understanding of each other. And spiritual is uh, agape, phileo, storge, romantic, sexual love, eros, uh, no lust. Um, you have some resources in your handbook. Um, because I don't understand the woman's body very well. I had to learn it. And what really is tragic, when I got into counseling, it wasn't too long I began to realize women don't understand their own body. Uh, they were used, they were traumatized, they were abused when they were kids. And if you bring scars into your marriage bed, those scars need to be addressed. I don't mean to mean, if you've been abused, boys or girls, if you've been violated, that healing needs to take place if you're going to have the full, open, honest, intimate love relationship God intended for you. So, but uh, I still say, I, there's a book by Tim Allen Gardner and Scott Stanley that's called Sacred Sex, What God Intended Sex to Be. Uh, imagine that. God said it's sacred. Uh, I don't remember last time, uh, Dr. E. Robert Jordan preached through Song of Solomon. I wasn't there for it, but I wish I was. You know, uh, how, do you, how do you figure out how God made sex so sacred and beautiful? He designed it. Christ in the church, his bride, you and me, husband, wife, the mystery. Everything changes after the honeymoon. And we don't know how to, and we, unfortunately, we do damage on the honeymoon that we didn't know about. You know, we can violate our wives not knowing that there's been trauma because she never shared it because she thought she was ugly and unmarriable. And if I tell him the truth about what happened to me, he won't want me. So I won't tell him till after the wedding, then we're married. And then he doesn't know about that. He pushes your buttons and there's trauma on the honeymoon. What a lousy way to start the marriage. So I ask people, and I'll meet with couples individually, he or her, and say, um, I want to know. And I, how do you find out about sexual trauma? Uh, so here's something worth thinking about. I asked them, how do you find out sexual trauma? They won't just tell, oh, yeah, I was traumatized this way and that way. So I said, so when, how old were you when you first learned about sex? I said, and then they, they'll tell me, you know, 8, 12, whatever it is, and say, for girls, you know, when, she, when they get their menstrual cycle. And, and so I said, uh, how, you know, what were the lessons you learned? And I try to make it safe, and I talk candidly about things like masturbation. So there, um, I talk about it every week, almost every day of every week. So if, to me, it's regular. If I'm offensive to you, I hope, uh, I told Pastor I'm going to go to the core stuff. So this is kind of down where the rubber meets the road. So I don't mean to be offensive or inappropriate. I'm glad the whole church is in here, just you mature people. And... Uh, uh, so, so when I start talking to them, I ask guys, when did you first learn about sex? And some guys learned about sex. I I'll tell you how I learned about sex. My uncle, who wound up leaving his wife, being a gay lifestyle, um, put a Playboy magazine on the second floor of my mother's car. And when my brother, who got climbed in first, I climbed in after. I think I'm about six years old. I felt that s s shiny paper slip. And so what was that? So I pick it up and I look at it. And it's Playboy and there's new pictures in there. And I say, Mommy... There's ladies in this magazine with no clothes on. And her comment to me was, I'm about six, my brother's younger. And she says, well, you have to learn about that somehow. Biology class. Health class says sexually transmitted disease. Biology talks about reproduction. Church says, don't do it. And uh, uh, so, so w w in the locker room, what do I say in the locker room? Oh, girls this, girls that. I don't know what the girls say in the girls' locker room because I don't go there. But all that's going on. So how do you learn? So sex is sacred. It's God designed. And I want to know what God said of it. What did he intend? Because I'm reading through the Bible and I'm not, I'm not picking out those passages. It's not registering. So I'm so glad that some people talk about sacred sex. Um, Sharon Etheridge, uh, she writes about the passion principles. She really understands. She helps the basic mechanics in that book. How, how do you pleasure a wife? How do you pleasure a husband? Well, they're so easy. So how, how do you do that? Um, she wrote a bestseller that was a New York Times, uh, The Sexually Confident uh, Wife. They wanted her to name the book The Sexually Competent, Confident Woman. She wouldn't do it. She's a Christian. 
She says, this is about marriage. This isn't about sex. Beautiful, beautifully done. And then uh, how do you teach your kids? Family Life Ministries. Um, what's that guy's name? The weekend to remember? Rainy, that's right, Dennis Rainey. And his wife do this thing, uh, Passport to Purity. It's a kit. Uh, it's got a CD uh, that you take away. I would take my grandson now, take away for a weekend, leave on a Friday night, listen to, he says all things that you and I are uncomfortable saying. Uh, go through the CDs himself. It's five or six CDs. And uh, he says all the words that you don't want to say to your son or your daughter. Uh, moms with girls. This, and then uh, I recommend at the end, one thing Kathy and I agreed on, is that when it came to sex talks, I wanted to talk to my firstborn son, and uh, I wanted her, encourage her, talk to him. You're a girl. You know, you know what stupid is. Talk to him. And when my daughters came of age, I talked to my girls in a very respectful way as best I could, yet intimate enough so that we were talking about the same thing. I encourage dads to talk to their daughters. Definitely talk to your sons. I encourage moms. And uh, when it things talking about, you know, uh, relationships in high school, and I would just say, you know, do you want your dad to kiss someone else's mom? No. Do you want your mom to kiss someone else's dad? Absolutely not. Well, when you're making out in junior high or high school, you're kissing someone else's mom or your daddy because you're probably not going to marry him. And so if you talk to them about that, you can, you can get them to see how what you're doing in junior high or high school, you're with someone else's mom or someone else's dad. Ew, okay. Now that's a challenge for fidelity to a marriage. There's a whole lot in those. So there's a few illustrations for you to think about how you want to do what you want. Excuse me, what you want to do. So there's your sex talk. What's the biggest sex organ? Your brain. And if you're going to be in a relationship and it's never too late, I hope that you would choose to be in a relationship with someone you wish to help them meet their full potential in Christ. I hope you're with someone that is willing to help you reach your full potential in Christ. For his glory. Father God, we're uh, trying to do good work. We're trying to share truth in a respectful, sacred way. And yet to discuss things that maybe we've never discussed before. Maybe we have, but maybe we're not living that way. Maybe we need to know how to sh share it on. Lord, the theme is suffering. And I just believe there's tremendous suffering in marriages for the best of couples. Lord, it, it, the loving relationship that you have with your bride, we ought to have with ours. Help us to repent. Uh, Lord, we've started a conversation. I pray this conversation will go with couples, uh, that the men would man up and take responsibility and initiate further conversation with his bride and ask her, can we talk more respectfully and share any stories he has to lead in the example? Lord, I pray wives would follow the good example of a husband and share her stories and frustrations and disappointments and repent of sins ask for forgiveness, commit to learning and practicing a new lifestyle for your glory and the good of the family. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.